Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is a special Screencast-O-Matic recording for the source reading on Upfront Scholastic Pandemic. In this particular part of the presentation, we're going to be looking at the content from the article. And once again, as you view or listen, you are welcome to answer the key concept questions as they appear on the Google Doc. So before I get started, please let me encourage you to open up to today's lesson to the correct part. And then once again, answer the key concept questions with detail and format them accordingly. Here we go. Pandemic. More than 100 years before the coronavirus pandemic, a powerful flu killed tens of millions of people worldwide and brought life in many U.S. cities to a standstill. When Violet Harris, a 15-year-old junior at Lincoln High School in Seattle, learned on October 5, 1918 that officials were shutting down the schools to halt the spread of the deadly disease known then as the Spanish flu, she responded, like many students, with excitement. It was announced in the papers tonight that all churches, shows, and schools would be closed until further notice to prevent Spanish influenza from spreading. She wrote in her diary, good idea. I'll say it is. So will every other school kid, I calculate. But those initial good feelings didn't last. They soon turned to worry as the flu spread throughout her community, forcing everyone to wear masks whenever they went outside and even infecting her best friend, Reina. I stayed in all day and didn't even go to Reina's, Violet wrote about a month later. The flu seems to be spreading, and Mama doesn't want us to go around more than we need to. If Violet experience, Violet's experience sounds familiar, that's because more than 100 years before COVID-19, the world faced another deadly pandemic. It's estimated that by the time the flu subsided in 1919, it had infected one in every three people worldwide and killed at least 50 million, making it the worst pandemic since the bubonic plague in the 14th century. Though the COVID-19 death toll has been far lower than that of the 1918 flu, many historians see similarities between the two pandemics. But just as today, officials back then were forced to make difficult decisions about closing schools and implementing social distancing. I'm often struck by how ancient this current pandemic feels, says Laura Spinney, author of Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918 and How It Changed the World. We don't have a vaccine yet, so the only way we can slow the spread of the disease is to use the social distancing measures, and they are not new. They were used in 1918 and in previous pandemics. Next section, World War I and the flu. Though it was dubbed the Spanish flu, some experts think it originated in the U.S. However, nobody knows for certain. What is known is that on March 4, 1918, a young man showed up with the flu at the hospital at Camp Funston, an army base in Kansas where soldiers were training for combat in World War I. Over the next few weeks, more than 1,000 men reported to the camp hospital with the same symptoms and 38 died. As thousands of Americans were sent to Europe to fight in war that spring, they took the flu with them. It spread rapidly, hitting every country hard. The U.S., Britain, and other countries censored their press during wartime, making it illegal to uh, publish anything that might hinder war efforts, including that a deadly disease was spreading among troops. But Spain, not a combatant in the war, had no censorship, and its press reported extensively on the disease, so it became known as the Spanish Influenza. At first, the disease was no worse than the seasonal flu, so health officials did little to prepare for a major outbreak. But as the virus mutated and became stronger, a second, more lethal wave of influenza began to sweep around the globe, and in August, uh, returning soldiers brought this new super flu back to the crowded army bases that were now all over the U.S. Most flus especially endangered the very old and very young, but this flu was different. The majority of its victims were between the ages of 20 and 40, and they would turn blue in the face, have trouble breathing, and even bleed from the nose and mouth. These men start what appears to be an attack of influenza. When brought to hospital, they were very rapidly developed the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. An army doctor stationed near Boston wrote to his friend on September 29, 1918. It is only a matter of a few hours, then until death comes, and it is simply a struggle for air until they suffocate. We have been averaging about 100 deaths per day, and it is still keeping it up. Garage is full of caskets. The U.S. and the world was ill-prepared to stop such a deadly disease. Scientists didn't know that the flu was caused by a virus, and their vaccines aimed at bacteria proved useless. Plus, with so many American nurses and doctors over in Europe because of the war, hospitals in the U.S. were understaffed. At the same time, the demands for war created the perfect conditions for a contagious virus to spread. Factories were jam-packed with workers producing ships and ammunition, and barracks were crowded with young men training for combat, placing large numbers of people in close contact. Making the situation worse, many public officials downplayed the threat of the virus or spread misinformation. President Woodrow Wilson never mentioned the flu in a public address, even though it's believed he contracted the disease himself in 1919. 
The U.S. Surgeon General assured Americans that there is no cause for alarm if precautions are observed. New York City's public health director claimed that the other bronchial diseases and not so-called Spanish influenza were causing the illness. And rumors ran rampant in that Germany, which opposed the U.S. in the war, had planted the disease to infect American soldiers and their allies. Because of the war, there was a concerted effort to keep morale up, says John M. Barry, author of The Great Influenza, which turned out to be counterproductive. Indeed, the refusal to acknowledge the severity of the crisis proved deadly, most notably in Philadelphia. On September 28, 1918, about 200,000 people packed downtown for a Liberty Loan Parade to promote the government bonds that were being issued to pay for the war. Although doctors had urged city officials to cancel the parade, the patriotic event went on. As the crowd cheered, the floats and troops and virus silently spread. About 4,500 Philadelphians died in the next week. Too many to bury. They had so many that died and that they kept putting in the garages. Anne Van Dyke, a Philadelphia resident, later recalled in an oral history, garages full of caskets. Philadelphia was far from the only city hit hard by the virus. In October, the death toll of the U.S. skyrocketed to 195,000 Americans died from the flu in that month alone. Hospitals across the country were overrun with patients. Tents serving as emergency relief centers sprang up in parks and fields. As the dust mounted, many U.S. cities shut down schools, theaters, restaurants, and churches, banned public events, and urged social distancing. Society seems to grind to a halt. That was the roughest time ever, Glenn Holler who lived in uh, Conover, North Carolina during the pandemic later recalled. People would come up and look in your window and holler and see if you were still still alive. It's almost about all. They wouldn't come in. Then almost as fast as it had spread, the flu disappeared. That was partly because so many people had already been infected by the virus that they developed immunity to it. Life in many cities returned to normal, and Violet, the Seattle high school student, went back to school on November 14th after a month and a half of lockdown. Our teachers were pretty lenient today, she wrote in her diary, except Miss Streeter, her Latin teacher. She gave out the words just the same as we hadn't had in six weeks to forget them in. Back to normal. A third wave of the flu followed in the winter and spring of 1919, but it wasn't quite as lethal, eventually morphing into a common flu. In May of that year, the flu mostly burned itself out, but not before leaving a staggering amount of death in its wake. In all, 675,000 Americans died during the pandemic, more than the total number of U.S. soldiers killed in the wars of the 20th century combined. Yet the 1918 pandemic was long relegated to the back pages of history, overshadowed by World War I. That is until COVID-19 exploded into a pandemic earlier this year. Now many people are re-examining the 1918 pandemic and its aftermath for a preview of how COVID-19 might change society. For example, a recent study by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York found out uh, that the flu may have helped give rise to the Nazi party and other extremists. The study notes that the disease may have fostered a hatred of others as it was perceived to come from abroad. But there were also some positives that came out of the 1918 pandemic. For instance, our knowledge of science and medicine became much more sophisticated, and that has given doctors and researchers many advantages to fight against COVID-19, and they didn't have back then. Ultimately, historians say we can take some solace in knowing that after the 1918 flu, life eventually returned to normal for many people even if the pain of the pandemic was very long-lasting. The evidence suggests that societies do bounce back quite quickly from pandemics, even from the 1918 flu, Spiney says. The trouble is that the individual level, the price paid, was huge amounts of misery and suffering. So, at this time, you are able to answer the key concept questions, but before you do, let me go ahead and leave you with this thought. There are many similarities that history can teach us and show us, both from a historical standpoint and also from a sociological standpoint. Think about how the pandemic today has affected our sociology for the present day and how it might leave ramifications for the days of tomorrow. Thank you very much for tuning in and good luck with the rest of the lesson.